Good morning. If you are visiting with us today, my name is Edgar. I serve on the pastoral staff here at ZF. We are glad that you are worshiping with us. And if you, this is the first time you come in this month, we have been going through the book of, the series in the book of Leviticus. I love Drew's rendition of his, uh, the way he described it, the book where our Bible readings go to die. I hope after this series, as Drew is taking his time to lay out the meaning and the importance of Leviticus, that we are seeing Christ through this book. And it has deepened my own appreciation for the book of Leviticus, even as I go through the book of Hebrews and seeing Jesus Christ. So today, we are in chapter 10. So the process of electing and consecrating a new pope of the Catholic Church is a big deal. It captures the whole world's attention, and should I say with bated breath, especially for those in the Catholic uh, community. The process has been in existence since 1260 eight without little or no change. 120 cardinals get together in a conclave and they are locked in there and would pray and vote four times a day, 120 of them until one of them gets a two-third majority and that person is chosen as the Catholic bishop. And the announcement comes as the world is waiting. You know, as the smoke, the white smoke rises through the, the, uh, the chapel in St. Peter's Basilica, the whole world knows that there is now a new Catholic pope. Now imagine, after all that encumbering exercise, The new pope comes out and immediately does something terribly wrong. On his first day on the job, he comes out and he does something terribly wrong. And God strikes him dead. Imagine the feeling that was sent throughout the world and the Catholic community. The context of our text today is analogous to the scenario I have just painted for us. After God had finished establishing the various offerings in Leviticus 1 and 7, he followed it by a detailed ordination process of Aaron and his sons to serve as priests before him in chapter 8. And in chapter 9, Aaron and his sons performed their first official duty by presenting an acceptable offering before God on behalf of the congregation. And it tells us in chapter 9, And fire came out from before the Lord and consumed the burnt offering. But in chapter 10, things immediately went terribly wrong. Aaron's two eldest sons, Nadab and Abihu, made a terrible mistake of failing to follow the Lord's instruction by offering what is called unauthorized fire, or what other versions call a strange fire, a profane fire. So God immediately struck them dead. First day on the job, the entire community was aghast by the, that tragedy. And public worship was now in jeopardy of ending barely when it had got started. And to prevent this tragedy from snowballing, the Lord gave Moses and Aaron more instructions and responsibilities for the priesthood. At the heart of this narrative is the assertion that Because God is holy, obedience among his priests is not optional, and his glory 
cannot be compromised among his people. Therefore, my goal this morning is to urge you to appreciate the fact that because God is holy, he requires his people to carefully follow his instructions in worship and not to make light of his glory. That's what I want us to see here today in this chapter. Join me as we explore this together, but before, let's pray. Our Father, how grateful we are for your word and your instructions and your Holy Spirit that teaches our hearts to know your word and that helps us to obey. As Taylor said this morning, we are all guilty. We have all failed you. But help us this morning as we go through this message that you will speak to us and that we would appreciate the weightiness of your holiness, Lord, once again in our hearts. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's read together. If you don't have a Bible, please look under the seat in front of you. There is a Bible. And if you don't have one, take that home to be yours as a gift from us. Let's read together the text from Leviticus 10. We read the whole chapter. So now Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it and laid incense on it and offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. And fire came from, up from before the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, This is what the Lord has said, Among those who are near me, I will be sanctified, and before all the people I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. And Moses called Mishael and Elzaphan, the sons of Uziel, the uncle of Aaron, and said to them, Come near, carry your brothers away from the front of the sanctuary and out of the camp. So they came near and carried them in their coats out of the camp. As Moses had said, And Moses said to Aaron and Eleazar, the Ethermah, his sons, do not let the hair of your head hang loose, and do not tear your clothes, lest, lest you die. Wrath came upon all the congregation. But let your brothers, the whole house of Israel, bewail the burning that the Lord has kindled. And do not go outside the entrance of the tent of meeting, lest you die. For the anointing oil of the Lord is upon you. <clears throat> and they did according to the word of Moses. And the Lord spoke to, Mo to Aaron, saying, <coughs> Excuse me. Drink no wine or strong drink. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> and the Lord said to uh, <clears throat> And the Lord spoke to Aaron saying Drink no wine or strong drink Your sons with you When you go into the tent of meeting Lest you die It shall be a statute forever Throughout your generations you are to distinguish between the holy and common, between the unclean and the clean. And you are to teach the people of Israel the statutes that the Lord has spoken to them by Moses. Moses spoke to Aaron and Eliezer and Ithamar, his surviving sons. Take the grain offering that is left of the Lord's food offerings and eat it unleavened beside the altar, for it is most holy. You shall eat 
it in a holy place because it is your due, your son's due, from the Lord's food offerings. For so I am commanded. But the breast that is waved and the thigh that is contributed, you shall eat in a clean place, you and your sons and your daughters with you, for they are given as your due. And your sons do from the sacrifice of, of peace and offerings of the people of Israel. The fire that is contributed and the breast that is waved, they shall bring with the, with the food offering of the fat pieces to wave for a wave offering before the Lord. And it shall be yours and your sons with you as a do forever, as the Lord has commanded. Now Moses diligently inquired about the goat of the sin offering. And behold, it was burned up. And he was very angry with Eliezer and Ithma, the surviving sons of Aaron, saying, Why have you not eaten the sin offering in the place of the sanctuary, since it is a thing most holy and has been given to you, that you may bear the iniquity of the congregation to make atonement for them before the Lord. Behold, its blood was not brought into the inner part of the sanctuary. You certainly ought to have eaten it in the sanctuary, as I commanded. And Aaron said to Moses, Behold, today the Lord, have, uh, they have offered their sins offering and their burnt offerings before the Lord. And yet such things as these have happened to me. If I had eaten the sin offering today, would the Lord have approved? And Moses, when Moses heard that, he approved. So this is a story. It's a very interesting one. And it's one of the two narratives in the whole book of Leviticus. And the first, we will have, we will go through Three movements here. The first movement here is the sinful conduct of Aaron's sons. Why would they do such a thing on this day that they have been set aside to be priests of the Lord and to listen to his command? Verse 1 begins with the words, Now, Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, and the function of the word there now is indicative that a previous action or event occurred before this. It is very important that we link this to what is going on in this chapter for a better understanding. Therefore, to put verse 1 into context, we must look back to the events that preceded it. And this is found in chapter 9, verse 22 to 24. That is the day after the ordination of Aaron and his four sons. They led the people in an inaugural worship as priests. There was ecstasy in the camp as God endorsed their worship with a clear, visible sign. We see that in 24, chapter 9. And fire came out from before the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the pieces of fat on the altar. And when all the people saw it, they shouted and fell on their faces. But sadly, probably later that very day, the people's ecstasy and for the manifestation of God's glory turned into, an, into agony as a result of the sinful conduct of Nadab and Abihu. In the afterglow of the ordination, Nadab and Abihu took matters into their own hands and offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, which was not commanded. Other versions of the Bible call it a strange fire, or rightfully so, a profane fire. Unlike the fire which, was, which we saw in chapter 9, verse 24, this fire was both unauthorized and not commanded. But what was the nature? Because the question, therefore, is what was the nature of Nadab and Abihu's sin? When it appeared that they had the right to present incense before the Lord. And to understand this, as I have already said, we must link it back 
to the first seven chapters of Leviticus, which shows us the establishment and the stipulation of the offering or the sacrificial system, followed by the special exercise that God went through of ordaining Aaron and his four sons over a period of seven days. We learned last week from Drew that this was an echo of Genesis. Of course, we have, we have learned it's, it's an echo of Eden, of how God's, God's shalom, he is wanting us to go back. He created this beautiful place of Eden, but man could not uphold God's standards. And so we see here that chapter 3 of Genesis is right here. The fall. God is planning his good purposes for man, but man, his priest, cannot uphold God's standards. Just like Adam and Eve's inability to uphold God's holy standards, but they succumbed to the temptation of the devil, and then came the fall. They did what was unauthorized and not commanded in the garden. So like Adam and Eve's sin, which was their failure to fulfill God's given, their God's given vocation by allowing themselves to, to be seduced by the serpent into believing that they could be like God. Nadab and Abihu, like many Old Testament priests, also found themselves guilty of this same offense. They failed to live up to the calling of their vocation by breaking with the pardon already established in chapter 8 and chapter 9. If we go through, there are so many verses as, you know, re the repetition as God commanded, as God commanded, as God commanded. Every time Moses did something, as God commanded. In chapter 8, verse 4, as God commanded, verse 9, 13, 17, 21, 29, chapter 9. Every time he said, as God commanded, as God commanded. But here we hear that they did what God did not command. Hence the stout reminder by Hebrews that Christ indeed is the only priest. Our only merciful priest, high priest in the service of God who is worthy to make propitiation for the sins of the people without blemish. Christ is the only. The priests may try the hardest they may, but they all failed. They could not meet God's standard. We have seen this epic failure the very first day on the job. Failed woefully. Let us examine verse 1 again closely to make sense of the nature of Nadab and Abihu's sin. It says, Now Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his Censor and put fire in it and laid incense on it and offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded. God didn't command it. God didn't tell them. God didn't expect them. They did. Took murders into their own hands. The text does not clearly inform us about the motive behind the sinful action. Although some commentators have implied that it was the sin of intoxication that may have caused them, of drunkenness that may have caused them to do that, because we see reference in verse 9 and 8 when God restricts Moses, uh, Aaron from drinking strong drink whenever they uh, uh, serve before him. This, could may have, this may could have been the very reason that the likelihood that they were intoxicated, but we don't know because the text does not clearly tell us that. However, since we do not know for sure, it is nonetheless safe to say that drunkenness does impair judgment and leads to some other vices. The Bible does not tell us that they were drunk, but it sure does. It would. It looks like. But let me make a quick theological pontification here. The passage did not forbid the priest from drinking strong drink. Rather, it says, drink no wine or strong drink, you and your sons with you, when you go into the tent of meeting, lest you die. 
Why am I saying this? Care must be taken here. Not to read into what God did not say. And not to apply it broadly to us today as many Christians tend to believe that drinking of alcohol is entirely sinful. The Bible does not say that. But the Bible does say, though, that intoxication and drunkenness is wrong. It's sinful. So this care must be very taken and not to read into what God did not say. Let's take God's word for what he says and believe it for what he says. And let's not add our feelings or traditions to God's word. On a different train of imagination, we can speculate that perhaps Nadab and Abihu were carried away by the afterglow and the significance that came with their consecration. And probably they assumed a level of unbridled authority to act as, as they pleased, forgetting that their priestly marching orders or authority solely subsisted in God's command. They have been consecrated. Maybe they are assuming that we got this authority to do as we please. No, your marching orders is subsisted in God's command. Even Moses is only doing what God commands. Do not go your own way and do things the way you want to do them. Because a holy God who demands full obedience from his priest, and by extension, he demands that from all of us today. Some have also argued that maybe they dared to press a little further into the tabernacle, past the veil, into the holies of holies. I do not know. Because it was a place only reserved for the high priest, where they went to make intercession on behalf of the community. Perhaps they thought too highly of their consecration and assumed that they are now worthy to and have the right into the presence of God as they please. And we all too often fall into those same traps. The Bible, I mean, not the Bible, but the, 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 the saying goes, you know, especially from Billy Graham's favorite hymn, Just As I Am, it says, come as you are, but don't come as you please. That's not what he's saying. Come as you are. Meaning, just as you are, come before the Lord, but not as you please, not as you presumptively think that this is the way I can do my own thing because I am free. Be mindful. A holy God demands holiness from his people. He cannot compromise it. Even today, he requires that of us. Christ has accomplished that, and he gives us grace by his Holy Spirit to live in holiness before a holy God. He has not changed his stance. God still demands holiness from his people. Their conduct could have also been profane because the fire they offered to the Lord was not kindled from the altar of burnt offering. It was a fire that was not associated with the atoning and redeeming work of the sacrificial system that was given with specifications. Or probably they said in your heart, isn't all fire fire? Isn't all fire fire? Or we may say, isn't all worship worship? It is. Let's just do it the way we feel, pragmatically. Let's just go and do it. I don't know. Maybe they may have thought that in their heart. Hence, they offered a fire of their own making that was not sanctioned by God, only to tragically realize that not all fire is a holy fire. Just like not all worship is true worship. Not all. God has, still has a standard. God still demands that his people must worship him in holiness and in truth. It's especially important for us today because in the name of making the gospel relevant to our current society and culture, many have veered into ways of making the gospel so creative and pragmatic 
and they are doing things the way God has not commanded. And they think that by so doing, they please God. They win the people, they bring the people, but are they bringing them to God? We must be careful here. Worship must be true. Worship must not be, we must, we must not trade uh, orthodoxy for pragmatism. Truth for heresies and the redeeming power of our Savior for personal aggrandizement and praise of men. As so many so-called Christian worship glows with self-will and partisan zeal more than actually offering God praise. It's all about the self, our preferences. So, is our worship not profane when we worship God for only what we can get from Him and not for who He is? You are a good, good Father. That's who you are. You are a good Father. Do we? Is our worship not unauthorized when it gets lost in the, work, in the works of artistry and performance of the band? Rather than focusing or reflecting on the worthiness of our God in corporate settings like this or in our personal lives? Is our worship not unauthorized and commanded? When our eager desires or the self becomes the object of our worship, rather than surrendering our will to God, is our worship not profane when we come into His presence as we please without any regard for reverence or fear of God? Quickly hear the next movement, God's judgment on Aaron's sons. We see that in verse 2. The bizarre action of Nadab and Abihu invoked a swift divine justice that sent shockwaves throughout the community. Probably nobody saw it coming that day, that it would end on a saw and somber note. One moment they were rejoicing, and the next they were mourning because the same God who visited them in glory and power has visited his priests in fury and judgment. And this is not the kind of God many people want today. In fact, many people shy away from this aspect of God's character. They do not want a God who judges sin. No, don't tell me about a God who judges sin. I want the one who gives me everything I want. How I want it. When I want it. Where I want it. How everything. Not the one who judges sin. And this concept comes to bear, especially when we compare the literary structures of the two events in chapter 9, verse 24, and 10, verse 2. There is a parallel and contrast between these two verses in respect to their outcome. For instance, look at the physiology about the fire of God in both verses. I mean chapter 9, verse 24. Each verse repeats the words, and fire came out from before the Lord and consumed. However, there is a sharp contrast between the aspects or the effects of the fire of God in both instances. Look at this. In chapter 9, verse 24, the fire from God consumed the burnt offering and the pieces of fat on the altar. But the fire of God in chapter 10, verse 2 the fire, of, the fire of God from, from God consumed them. That is Nadab and Abihu. Again, in chapter 9, verse 24, the results of the consuming fire of God brought great rejoicing among the people, such that they shouted and fell on their faces in worship of the Lord. But in chapter 10, verse 2, look at that. The result of the consuming fire of the Lord brought death and mourning into the camp. The same fire from God. In other words, the same fire in chapter 9 that reveals God's glory now brought judgment on the unfaithful priests. And this goes to show that the Lord was absolutely serious about his demands for following his instructions and in worshiping him. As mentioned previously, this text 
has often raised questions in the minds of some people as to why God took such a drastic step against the very people he has set aside for his service. Why didn't he just warn Nadab and Abihu or forgive them as he had forgiven their father Aaron in Exodus 32 when he led the people to worship the golden calf? And when Moses came, he says, they, they gave me, they gave me their, their jewelries. I threw it in the fire and came out a calf. Beautiful. And then they worship. God would have struck him dead right there. But God visited the, commu- the community and killed so many of them. God spared Aaron there. God kills his sons here. So it confuses us. Well, isn't it true that we cannot judge the Lord? By our feeble sins, because we may never understand his ways. His ways are past finding. It could have been, unto whom much is given, much is expected. The case of unto whom much is given, much is expected. In fact, Calvin observes it this way. And this is a quote I must quote. It's beautiful. It's a, Calvin says, John Calvin says, if we, we reflect on how holy a thing God's worship is, the enormity of the punishment, that means for Nadab and Abihu, will by no means offend us. Besides, it was necessary that their religion, religion should be sanctified at its very commencement. For if God has suffered the sons of Aaron to transgress with impunity, they would have afterwards carelessly neglected the whole law. This, therefore, was the reason for such great severity that a priest should anxiously watch against all profanation. I love it. God said, I'm not going to let this happen. It's going to snowball. And I'm going to address it right now and deal with it. So let us look at who this war. Maybe that will help us understand why God would do such a thing, or as Calvin is saying here. Nadab and Abihu were no strangers to the holiness and glory of God. We see that in Exodus chapter 24. They were among the select few, including Moses, Aaron, and 70 other elders of Israel, who God said will come to Mount Sinai and see me. They were there. And on top of that, they had just been a part of an elaborate ordination that lasted for seven days, which in God's ecosystem signifies completion and perfection, as it were, in the creation narrative. They had witnessed all the instructions Moses and their father received from the Lord. So they were well-groomed for the duty they had assumed, and were next in line for succession should their father die. They were next in line to be the high priest. So they were not novices. They knew what God required of them. I hope this is helpful in helping us see how the ceremonial impropriety of offering God a profane fire was a flagrant disregard for God's glory and holiness. And perhaps it was better For those two to die. To be especially an example that a peace people would not treat his glory with contempt. Very first day, I'm going to act. We see that in the book of Acts. Ananias and Sapphira. First day, bam, bam, bam. They died. And we don't know why, but God chooses to do things as he pleases. Let me ask you a question. Are you here this morning and struggling under the weight of some guilt right now, thinking that you deserve nothing but the Lord's judgment, like Nadab and Abihu? If you are, here's the assurance I want to give you. Taylor did say this morning, we are all guilty. We are all guilty as charged. We all deserve God's striking this morning that we can't even go home. If you think that you are out of it, you are kidding, you're fooling yourself. We are all guilty. And God will strike us dead. 
And that's the reason why he sent his son. And we are only justified because Jesus paid the appeasement from the wrath of God that brought us our peace. But however, if you are not following Christ and you're, as your Lord and Savior, please ask someone who is a Christian what it means. Because God deals with sin. The last movement here briefly is ramification for the community. By now we have established that something went terribly wrong in the full view of everyone in the Israelite camp. Nadab, Abihu have sinned. God passed divine judgment on them. And Moses, God's spokesman, responded. And his response, he set the tone for the rest of the chapter, in my view. Of course, meaning that God spoke through Moses. And here is what he said in verse 3 says. Then Moses said to Aaron, this is what the Lord said. Among those who are near me, I will be sanctified. Before all the people, I will be glorified. God's response through Moses shows that Nadab and Abihu's sinful action was an affront or was, an, was a mutiny to God. Because the chief purpose of God's covenantal relationship with his people was that the glory and honor of his name will be preserved. Just as the Westminster Catechism also says, the chief purpose of man is what? To glorify God and to enjoy him forever. That's the reason we exist. And that's what God wanted to do among his people. So God said to Aaron through Moses, among those who are near me, I will be sanctified. And this was probably a direct reference to the priest, those whom he had consecrated for service before him. For such people upholding the holiness of God to the highest regard was not optional because it was only by the example that the rest of the congregation will learn how to revere the holiness of God. They needed to. And by this same token now, all those who are in Christ have been ushered into this priesthood of all believers, as Peter says, that we are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praise of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light, 1 Peter 1, 9. Therefore, we are no longer exempted from those who have access to the nearness of God. You and I have access to God because we are members of the, the, the priesthood of all believers. But sadly, many Christians do not treat the aspect of God's holiness with the weightiness it deserves. They think that they can come before God just as they please, as I had said, and do just as they like without any regard for His holiness. Alcides Pro makes a compelling observation, and I must quote this again along that line. The quote is on the screen. Here's what Alcides Pro says. One aspect of the modern church that most saddens and concerns me is that believers are no longer encouraged to have a healthy fear of God. We seem to assume that the fear of the Lord is something that belongs to the Old Testament period. And it is not to be a part of the life of the Christian. But fear of God involves not simply a trembling before his wrath, but a sense of reverence and awe because of his glorious holiness. I agree. I agree. That's really compelling. And the verse 4 says, And before all the people I will be glorified. And this is especially important because the whole purpose of the priesthood was to lead God's people in, t in the tabernacle worship or the temple worship as it were. So the people, not the priests, were the apex of God's affection. He loved his people. He cared for his people, not the priests. 
He was only using the priest to reach to his people. So verse 3 ends with the words, Aaron held his peace. After all of this has happened, he was silent. Aaron didn't say a word. One may wonder why Aaron held his peace or did not say a word in the face of the tragic death of his sons. It would have been natural for him at least to lament his sons, but he probably acknowledged the severity of what Nadab and Abihu has done. And he was, not, he was not right before God. And he may have just accepted the judgment in respect of God's holiness over his right to pass his own personal grief. He was able to see the wrong of his children from God's standpoint, despite the fact that the ceremonial law prohibited priests to mourn while serving before God in his sanctuary. There is a lesson for us here as parents, every parent here, grandparents. We should never let the love for our children trump your be our obedience to God. Never. In other words, when it comes to doing what is right before God and pleasing our children in their rebellion against God, we should always honor God. Honor Him. Let not the love for our children cause us to do anything that displeases God. Honor God with all your heart. They belong to the Lord. If they fall away, if they walk away, pray for them. Pray for them, but do not compromise your standards or God's standards in the name of loving them. We see it here clearly. In verse 4 to 7, Moses commanded two of their relatives to come and remove them from the temple. And they went and, and did exactly as it was. Does, doesn't this go to show? But then he, pre, he prohibited Aaron and his other sons for mourning. But he told the entire community that they can go ahead and mourn. Which proves to us that even in his judgment, he still has empathy. I love Lamentation that says, as in 3.17 or so, but in chapter 3 it says, For God does not willingly bring affliction to his children. Even in affliction, God still has mercy. He shows grace as he he has done. In verse 8 to 11, God now spoke directly to Aaron, warning him and his remaining sons of what they should now do lest they die so that they will be able to distinguish between the holy and the profane, clean and unclean. And yet again, to reinforce that his glory would not be undercut among his people. The priests were chosen to reach God's people. Because God's people are the apex of his heart. In verse 12, Moses gave the final instructions to Aaron and his surviving sons regarding the sacrificial ritual of what the portions were. But we realize that in, either in fear or whatever, you read the rest, they failed again to do what they were supposed to do. They were supposed to eat the sin offering. They were supposed to but they put it on fire. And Moses, inquiring, was very angry. With Goodness, he has already seen two of his nephews die. What is going to happen again? But praise God, he didn't strike them dead. Aaron made a very good argument. Well, I don't know if it's that good. He said, after all that happened to me today, would God have been pleased even if I did eat it? God's mercy so we see at the heart of all of this that Nadab and Abihu, apart from the, the, the assumption that they were drunk, it could be, but there was really a disregard for God. Unlike these, the fear of God was upon them. They are afraid that if we did it, we would not. And that reminds us, but when it came to Christ, 
What they failed to do because the sin offering was to bring atonement for the people. And that's the important part of it. And they failed to do it. And God would have stricken them dead. But when Christ came, he took the bitter cup. As we did here this morning. He laid down his body on the cross. He didn't fail to go through with a sin offering. So that you and I will be saved and be redeemed. Three quick implications here as we close. One, what do, we, what, do we, what do we learn from this? Number one, that God hates sin. God does hate sin. Nadab and Abihu serves as a grim reminder that God is holy and he is hostile towards sinners. That's the truth. The only reason that we are not on the receiving end of God's hostility against sin is because of the mediator that we have between us and God. And that's what the Bible says, Christ being the mediator. It's that which prevents us from receiving God's hostility. God does hate sin. But when you become a, a if you're not a Christian, when you become a Christian, when you make God your friend, he wipes away all your sins and redeems you and gives you a new life, a new name, and gives you the freedom to enjoy his glory. Number two, God cares about how we worship. It is easy to think of worship as being conf confined to the songs we sing during the service. Beautiful songs. And the truth, our entire life should be an act of worship. It's not only when we are here. Worship is one word that sums up the life of a Christian. The worthiness of God. Worship is the worthiness of God. Recognizing his worthiness in everything you do. God cares about how we worship him. Lastly, God judges his own people. As Christians, we are called to be Christ's ambassadors to the world. He has entrusted us with much. And as we know unto whom much is given, much is expected. Let us fear God. Let us pray. Thank you, Father, for your word this morning that has come to us. We humble ourselves before you, claiming that we are all guilty of your wrath or to receive your wrath. But because of Jesus Christ's death on the cross, he has redeemed us. We help us not to treat you lightly, O oh God, in everything that we do, whether corporately or privately, in your name we pray. Amen.